exactly six years ago, on the 25th of January 2016, Giulio Reggeni, a PhD student at Girton College, disappeared while he was in Egypt, while carrying out fieldwork for his doctoral research on Egyptian independent trade unions. His body was found on the 3rd of February. He had been kidnapped, brutally tortured, and murdered. Kidnapped, tortured, and murdered. Since then, the long path to truth and justice soon revealed itself to be full of obstacles. Six years after Giulio's murder, we are still here, all of us, not just those who knew and loved Giulio while he was still alive, but all of us seeking justice. This is certainly not even about being Italian or about being an academic or a student in Cambridge or elsewhere. It concerns us all against violence of any sort, in the search for justice, in the search for truth, we are all involved. Since 2020, the Cambridge University Italian Society has organized the Giulio Reggiani Memorial Lecture. It is a little but significant contribution to keep Giulio's memory alive here in Cambridge and to stress, once again, that what happened to Giulio must not happen again. Last year, Julius' parents kindly accepted to be interviewed online by the Society. The recording of their interview is still available on the Italian Society's Facebook page. They also have been informed of today's event and have expressed their gratitude for this initiative, which they appreciate as part of that exercise of active memory, as they call it, in support of the search for truth and legal justice. They have also recommended that those who wish to get to know more about Giulio should read the book that they wrote together with Alessandra Ballerini entitled Giulio Fa Cose, published by Feltrinelli, which is now available as an e-book and has been translated into English as Giulio Still Does Things. Today, we are here to honor Giulio's memory in the best way we can in this context, by devoting ourselves to culture, research, and dialogue. And by discussing topics that are close to Giulio's research interests. I'm now very honored to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Elisabetta Brighi. Elisabetta Brighi is a senior lecturer in international relations at the University of Westminster. Between 2012 and 2014, she was a lecturer at the Department of Politics and International Studies here in Cambridge. Her main research interests are theories of violence, particularly mimetic approaches to violence and the relation between emotions, politics, and violence. She is also an expert in Italian foreign policy on which she has published extensively. Today, she will be talking on illusions of democracy, Europe and Egypt between interests, rights, and violence. Thank you very much, Elisabetta, for kindly accepting our invitation, and welcome back to Cambridge. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francesco. Thank you, Silvia, for trying so hard to get us online. I think we are. So I'm going to have to stand on this side of the room, unfortunately. So I, I apologize for the people sitting on this side of the room, but it's just that otherwise it won't capture my, so you're very welcome to move if you, if you feel like you want to see me, but it's up to you. Um, I will have to kind of stand here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francesco, for the invitation, which was very kind and unexpected in a way. Um, and it, I have to be honest, it filled me with all sorts of emotions and, and uh, impressions. Um, and thank you to the Italian Society for all the work that you've put in making this event possible. It is a very somber occasion, um, but I think precisely because of that, um, it's particularly important that we're able to be here together, um, even thanks to technology, in a way. So I want to start my remarks today very much in the spirit of what Francesco said, um, by saying very simply 
um, that as an academic, as a researcher, as a European citizen, and as an Italian national, I demand to know the truth about what happened to Giulio Regeni. There are many of us out there we have not forgotten, we will not forget, until the truth is out. Truth is what we seek in our profession as researchers, many of us in this room as well. We seek answers to our questions. The motto of my old PhD, Alma Mater, uh, quoted no less than the Latin poet Virgil, happy is she who is able to know the causes of things. I won't try that in Latin, but anyway. Um, but truth is not only an individual pursuit. Truth can be, and often is, a collective and political enterprise. To tell the truth, as Antonio Gramsci said and wrote in 1919, to arrive together at the truth is a revolutionary act. Truth matters, it concerns everyone, and sometimes it implicates everyone. And I would say that this is very much the case here. So I'd like to start by showing an image, which is not there actually. <laughs> we didn't open it in yet. No, no, no I'll, I'll probably find it, don't worry. It's right here in the downloads. Technology helped us, I think you can see it. I don't know if they're gonna be able to see it on YouTube, but anyway. So this is the image that I wanted to start with. It's a mural um, that cropped up in Naples in various places, in various spots uh, of Naples a few years ago. Um, and it's by the street artist and photographer, fairly well-known photographer now, uh, Eduardo Castaldo, also known as the Eddie. Um, and of course, it's a mural that was dedicated to Giulio Regeni. And some of these murals have faded. Some of some of them are still there, some of them are slightly different. I wanted to start with this one in particular, not so much for the image at the bottom of the mural, but for the inscription right at the top. La verità su Giulio è la verità sull'Egitto. Saying the truth about Giulio means saying the truth about Egypt. But I would add that saying the truth about this crime means also saying the truth about us. Us Europeans and us Italians, us in terms of our governments and their actions. What happened to Giulio Regeni matters, as Francesco was saying, and should concern us all as academics, as political and ethical subjects, as citizens. So I want to reflect on the political, ethical, and academic implications of Giulio Regeni's murder, and I'll do that in reverse order, starting from the last issue, but I will spend a lot more time on the first um, question of the political implications. Giulio Regeni's murder is an unprecedented and an unacceptable attack to the principle of academic freedom. I think that should be our shared starting point as an academic community. As Professor Khalid Fami, who sits in the audience today, recently wrote in a book published in Italian, just published in <clears throat> Italian, titled Minnena, the Giulio Regeni case marks, and I quote, a watershed moment with researchers now facing much more serious threats to their liberty and even to their lives than ever before, end of quote. This is unfortunately true for a number of countries in the world, for an increasing number of countries in the world. But Egypt perhaps represents the most glaring of cases. As political and ethical subjects, we should be alarmed by the statistics shared by organizations such as Human Rights Watch that estimate that around 60,000 political prisoners are currently locked up in Egyptian jails um, many of whom lawyers, activists, academics, artists, journalists. Since 2013, the beginning of Abdel Fattah al-Sisi's presidency, Egypt has entered, and again I quote um, Human Rights Watch, one of the worst human, crises, uh, human rights crises uh, in its recent history, with unfortunately widespread use of torture, 
practices such as extrajudicial killings, um, unlawful detention, and so on and so forth, trends that have sadly accelerated in the last five years or so. Giulio Regeni's murder lifted the veil on this landscape of violence. It has revealed the scale of the counter-revolutionary repression underway in Egypt. But its political implications are actually much wider than that. Firstly, it has revealed also Egypt's sense of impunity in the face of all these crimes. This is, after all, the stumbling block in the current trial, uh, which is stalled um, in Rome. Egypt's absolute denial of its involvement in Giulio Regeni's murder, its rejection of the results of the five-year inquiry, its refusal to let its agents be tried by a foreign state. However, impunity, just like its opposite, responsibility, accountability, always implies a relation. And that's why I think it's important to focus in my talk on the other side of the equation, on the other actor in the relation, the international community, and in particular Europe, European countries such as France and Italy. My argument, quite simply, is that Giulio Regeni's murder has implications for us, too. And I will turn to these now. When Al-Sisi came to power, following the 2003-2013 coup, the European Union and its government showed a very cautious and, in fact, sanctioning approach. Only a couple of years earlier, the EU, um, the EU had recognized the Arab uprisings as, and I quote, events of historic proportions, and declared that it, again, quote, wholeheartedly supported the wish of the people in our neighborhood to enjoy the same freedoms that we take as our right. Admitting, furthermore, that EU policies aimed at ensuring stability and security in its south neighborhood had failed, uh, partly because of their unqualified support for authoritarian regimes. When Al-Sisi came to power, therefore, European countries such as France and Italy showed quite a lot of caution and, in fact, apprehension. The then Italian foreign minister, for instance, Emma Bonino, was particularly outspoken, demanding that the EU push for an inclusive and peaceful political transition in Egypt. Further, when the Rabah massacre took place in August 2013, leaving almost 1,000 demonstrators um, on, the, on the tarmac killed in one day. Italy and France put their weight behind the EU to issue sanctions that targeted Egypt, and in particular um, aimed at halting all the military transfers to the country. <clears throat> so if this is what happened in 2013, the question poses itself, what well, has changed? If anything, repression in Egypt has become worse. And yet, the European response now pales in comparison to those early years. In fact, the harsher the repression in Egypt, the more acquiescent European states seem to have become. Why? Here, I have to and I want to turn to the question of interests, but also to the wider question of the evolving nature of the global order, and in particular the shifting um, power distribution, let's say, um, in world politics. Soon after his rise to power, Al-Sisi convinced European states that Egypt was a bulwark against Islamic terrorism and the only protection against massive migration flows from the Middle East. The fight against terrorism, in particular, became a favorite mantra for both the Egyptian government and the European governments on the other side of the Mediterranean, particularly those of François Hollande and Emmanuel Macron in France, and Matteo Renzi and Paolo Gentiloni in Italy. 20 years after the start of the global war on terror, it is widely accepted now that this narrative and the campaign um, that it followed has failed, as the parable of Afghanistan sadly illustrates. 
But the war on terrorism did succeed in some aspects, and I want to stress one. It served the purpose of allowing, catalyzing, justifying a massive process of rearmament, and with it, a shift in the distribution of power among countries and within countries as well. The Stockholm Peace Research Institute, CIPRI, has calculated that between 2001 and 2020, the volume of arms sales has nearly doubled in 20 years. And it reached levels only seen at the height of the Cold War. The global war on terror, in other words, has been an incredible business opportunity for the transnational defense industry, for private contractors, and for government elites. This, in turn, has intersected with a wider turn towards nationalist, reactionary, anti-democratic politics that has reverberated across the globe in different guises with different manifestations. <clears throat> this story is true about Egypt, but it's also true about European countries such as France and Italy. Egypt has recently become, uh, I'm not going to show data, but you, know, you can find it all on, on the CIPRI website. Egypt has recently become the third biggest arms importer in the world. Military imports have more than doubled in the last five years compared to the period between 2010 and 2015. The four C's is rise to power. Egypt ranked 15th in the world in terms of arms imports. Now it's third behind only Saudi Arabia and India. <clears throat> I think numbers give a fairly dramatic insight into the reality of a regime that is increasingly militarized, as we know, a regime where the security apparatus plays a crucial role both in terms of political and economic power. However, when we look at who is selling the arms to Egypt, that's where things become more interesting, and by interesting I mean more troubling. Between 2013 and 17, so the same years, France surpassed the United States to become the top provider of arms to Egypt after Russia. A third of all Egyptian arms um, imports currently comes from France, and one-fourth of all the French military exports now go to Egypt. French arms exports have reached the highest level in any five-year period since 1990, the end of the Cold War, with a 40% increase in the last five years, an increase that is directly driven by demand coming from the Middle East, and in particular, Egypt. Incidentally, the sharp increase in Egypt's arm imports is only possible thanks to a very deliberate policy of borrowing chosen by the El-Sisi regime, um, borrowing from those very countries that are selling arms to them. So, for instance, in 2015, I think it was a fairly sort of well-known case that Egypt, you know, bought uh, 24 Rafale uh, jet, jet fighters from France, and it was only able to buy those jet fighters because France actually lent Egypt the money um, in the form of a 3 billion euro loan. So, as analysts have noted, by accepting these loans, by accepting external loans, by buying weapons from abroad, by inviting large foreign direct investments, in Egypt, especially in the oil and gas sector, Egypt is effectively entrenching itself in the global financial markets. And al is effectively saying to European governments, you now have a stake in my survival. Which, of course, creates an incredible amount of interdependence, a significant mutual vulnerability between this country and the rest of the world. <clears throat> the arms sales that I've just illustrated and the way in which they were financed have not only strengthened and emboldened the Assisi regime, of course, predictably, they have also enabled the repression, um, not only financed it, but literally armed it. So just before Christmas, again, some of you may have seen this, um, there was a French investigative journalism platform called Disclose that published a number of leaked papers called the Egypt Papers. They, they sort of named them the Egypt Papers. And in these leaked documents, 
a lot of information sort of transpired um, and essentially illustrating the scale and the depth of cooperation uh, and mutual implication between Egypt and France in the war on terrorism, including, for instance, France's participation in a series of targeted killings uh, at the border between Egypt and Libya, but also the supplying by French tech companies of surveillance software <clears throat> to Egypt, which was regularly then used by Egypt to monitor and target internal opposition. So much that six months ago, a French court tried four executives, executives from these French tech companies and found them guilty of, I quote, complicity in torture and enforced disappearance in Egypt between 2014 and 2021. <clears throat> if this is true for France and its cooperation with Egypt, the same can be sadly said about Italy as well. To remain on the issue of arms sales in 2019, as many of us will know, Egypt, a country that, it's worth noting, is not part of Italy's historic alliances, NATO, the EU. Um, so Egypt became the first client of Italian weapons. It has remained Italy's top client in 2020 as well, with a volume of authorized transfer, military transfers, that has increased exponentially in the last five years. I'll just give you some quotes, some figures. 7 billion euros in 2016, 60 billion euros in 2017, 800 billion euros in 2019, and almost 1 trillion euros in 2020. The exponential growth is not only due to the quantity of arms sales, but the quality of the weapons that were sold. <clears throat> and here there's a very distinct change and progression. The trend started, in other words, in 2015, under Matteo Renzi's government, with a significant increase in the export of Italian small arms, light weapons, to, and surveillance software to Egypt which were then, of course, regularly employed by the Sisi regime to curb protests domestically. And therefore, they were already in breach of an Italian law that said that we cannot export, Italy can't export arms to countries that are engaged in human rights violations and conflicts. But the flow of arms significantly shifted gear in 2019, when Italy and Egypt struck a historic deal for the selling of complex weapon systems. Historic for both Egypt and Italy. <clears throat> Which, aside from the two frigates that have already been delivered, includes four more frigates, 24 Eurojet fighters, Eurofighter jets, sorry, a military satellite, and 24 light combat aircraft. Most of this equipment is produced by Fincantieri, which is part owned by the Italian state. And of course, it was financed once again through loans from both Italian banks and the Italian state. If this is true in terms of military cooperation, there is of course another area in which, <clears throat> to put it very succinctly in a way, Italy ha um, Egypt has become the most important country in the world for Italy and that's oil and gas. In 2015, uh, as is well known, Eni, the leading energy company in Italy, which is again part owned by the Italian state, discovered the largest ever natural gas field in the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, just off the coast of Egypt. Production, extraction and production immediately started. This was followed by a few more discoveries um, in the following years, and essentially in just a matter of three or four, five years max, uh, Egypt gained energy self-sufficiency thanks to Eni's uh, investments, something that would have been unthinkable even five years before for Egypt. Uh, the news came out two weeks ago um, that Eni was given a further five exploration licenses by the Egyptian government, essentially sealing the sort of deal and making the situation even more apparent that Egypt 
is now the most important production site for any in the entire world. <clears throat> so if this is all true, so what? To paraphrase the title of a particularly sharp and incisive piece by my colleague Andrea Teti, we could conclude that you know, European governments have rediscovered their love for dictators. Is that a problem? I would argue that it is on two levels, and I'm um, wrapping things up soon here. The first level is ethical and political, and the second level is practical and political. So firstly, on the ethical political level, is it a problem <clears throat> that things are this way for the European Union? I think it is. It's a problem because the European Union had promised to do the very opposite of what it's doing now only 10 years ago. Um, and it vowed not to repeat the same mistakes again by supporting authoritarian regimes. Um, so the EU seems to be suffering, at the very least, a very bad kind of short memory. Second, it's a problem because the dichotomy between interests and values, which is often used to justify Europe's cynical uh, behavior, is, as we've seen historically, a false dichotomy there is no real long-term stability without a modicum of social justice, a recognition of some basic rights, some sense of democracy. The two are not really in antithesis. Third, and this has consequences especially for European governments, to be a democracy you have to act like a democracy to some degree. Democracy is what democracy does, to paraphrase Forrest Gump, right? To really claim to be democratic, according to democratic theory, a democracy should pursue a foreign policy that at least is not completely incompatible with democratic values, when in fact it should ideally help other countries transition towards democracy. The opposite <clears throat> means that not only you're harming the prospects for democracy abroad, but you end up harming democracy at home, eroding democratic standards. And if we don't think that this is an issue, we just have to listen to what people in Egypt actually think about the European Union and European governments. Um, a well-known Egyptian human rights lawyer recently said to France 24, um, Fran and I quote, France behaves like an enemy of democracy. For us Egyptians, it's difficult enough to fight against the regime without also having to fight against its foreign patrons. Secondly, <clears throat> on a more practical and political level, there's an old saying that goes, truth has many enemies and lies have many friends. And I'm afraid that this might be one of those cases. The truth about what happened to Giulio is an extremely inconvenient truth. It is inconvenient for the Egyptian government, and this is presumably why it imposed first a gag order on the media, uh, you know, censoring any reporting on the matter, and then tried in the last six years to divert attention, you know, um, from it in all possible ways, um, including supporting a number of sort of conspiracy theories and sort of baseless um, arguments. But it is an inconvenient truth, not just for Egypt, it's an inconvenient truth for the parts of the Italian state too. As we've seen, <clears throat> there are sectors of the state with substantial vested interest in not rocking the boat, um, in maintaining good relations with Egypt despite everything, and perhaps finding a scapegoat elsewhere, including here, for instance, in Cambridge. There are sectors of the Italian state that have lent credibility and weight to the Egyptian propaganda around this case, some of you may remember uh, a video titled The Story of Regeni that appeared at first rather mysteriously on social media just the day before the trial was due to start in Rome last year. It not only featured Egyptian officials and Egyptian citizens, but it also approvingly featured prominent Italian politicians such as the former Italian defense minister Elisabetta Trenta, a former top military advisor to the government of D'Alema, Leonardo Tricarico, 
as well as very well-known, um, other well-known politicians and one well-known um, Italian journalist, Fulvio Grimaldi, who all spoke in agreement with the baseless claims that were being made in that video. This is not surprising, I think, given that some in Italy have gone so far as to even defend Egypt and calling Al-Sisi a great leader. This is what Matteo Renzi said, who happened to be the prime minister exactly six years ago today, when Giulio sadly disappeared. What is certain is that Italy's strategy to obtain the truth about this case has, as the president of the Regeni Commission recently stated, failed, and a change of gear is needed. Telling the truth about Giulio Regeni's murder means telling the truth about Egypt, but it also means telling the truth about us about our governments, about their actions, and about their responsibilities. And I believe that when the truth is finally out, because I am confident that it will eventually come out, we will see the full scale of the mutual entanglements, the mutual vulnerabilities and responsibilities that I have tried to illustrate today. This is why what happened to Giulio is so important politically, and why saying the truth about this crime would indeed be a political and deeply revolutionary act. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Decker, for this uh, very interesting paper, for the many significant data you illustrated and the very thoughtful uh, reflections that confirm once again that uh, truth is not easy to get closer to the truth is not easy at all <clears throat> but it's still fundamental especially if this truth is so inconvenient for many people unfortunately thank you again so our speaker is happy to answer questions and i'm sure that uh, uh, there will be many questions for the audience here or even from uh, people that are attending online. Thank you. Questions? Please. How much? How much does it export to Egypt? How many? How much in terms of arms does the UK? Export? The UK export to Egypt. Uh, it's not as high as France and Italy. The UK oh. has actually dropped substantially. I'm I'm, I'm sorry to announce. Yeah, well, <laughs> in terms of the rankings. Of course, exactly. Yeah. No, but as as a total volume, yeah, as a, as a global volume of arms transfers, uh, the UK I think has lost quite quite a bit in the last five years. Um, and it certainly hasn't developed the sort of special relationship yeah, with Egypt that France and Italy seem to be mm -hmm. cultivating, uh, let's say. So yes, that's, so, so that's, that's your question. Then the UK seems to be in a, in a slightly marginal uh, position within you know, the scope of this relationship, of this particular relationship. And I think, I mean, the, the wider implication of that um, is really that things are very much in flux. You know, things are changing in terms of um, regional politics, in terms of balance of power between regions, yeah? um, and, between and in terms of alliances or alignments, let's say. Yeah? So I think there's, there's a lot that is kind of in evolution, in flux. And, um, and yes, it is surprising to see, you know, for instance, that France has taken this, you know, the place of the US that was traditionally kind of you know, uh, the, the, the country that would sort of arm Egypt rather than you know, other countries. So I think there's a lot of kind of surprising and, and sort of evolving you know, data uh, in, the, in, in this area, which is why I kind of focused on, on, on it today. Thank you. Very, very, very good. Just a question. I know you realize that you and Italy and the 
Italians, a lot of people, they try to clean waste. Has anything actually materialized in terms of even the officials behind bars? What have we managed or finally moved the needle on some fair fairness for Julio or making sure these things don't happen again? It's a, it's a, it's a big question. Um, the short answer to that, yes, a lot has happened. Um, unfortunately, it hasn't reached any conclusive um, end. So, in other words, the, you know, the, the, the battle for truth and justice is still uh, very much open. Um, what has happened is a couple of things. Um, one, of course, is that uh, you know, investigations were carried out for five years and a trial has officially started now in Rome against four agents of the National Security uh, um, uh, Office, uh, the Egyptian National Security. Um, unfortunately, the trial is not going ahead um, because essentially Egypt is refusing to let its agents be tried um, somewhere else. Um, and, you know, I, I won't sort of bore you with too many details, but essentially the fact that we don't have 100% certainty that those four agents know that they've been, they've been tried, right, means that the, process, the, the trial cannot go ahead. So this is the stumbling block that unfortunately is keeping the trial in, in a position of kind of stall. Um, the other big thing that happened was that about four years ago, um, a bunch of Italian MPs, and in particular one, um, essentially presented a motion for the institution of a commission, an interparliamentary commission, um, to investigate you know, uh, what happened to Julia, essentially, the, you know, the murder of Julia Regina. The commission was eventually set up <clears throat> in 2019, if I'm not mistaken, um, and it worked for two years um, to essentially gather very much in parallel to, to sort of, you know, the, the, the investigation of the prosecution, um, to gather all the information um, able to provide an account, you know, a, a sort of a historical account, yeah, of, of those events. Um, personally, I follow those works quite closely. I think um, they have been very important, and the Commission as a whole has worked very well, very thoroughly, you know, uh, on the matter, and it has recently produced uh, its final report, which is out. Um, and it's a long report, 400 pages of, um, uh, of, of details, um, essentially reaching the same conclusions as the prosecution, that yes, Egypt has, was involved in this murder, um, and, and advancing a number of kind of, you know, uh, uh, hypotheses about why that may have been the case. Um, this has been presented, it's been published, and I think probably the Italian Parliament will probably discuss it as in a plenary session. That might be another moment of debate, you know, another moment in which you know, Italy sort of you know, uh, looks around and, and sort of tries to find out what to do about this, uh, you know, what to do about this case. So, in other words, to answer your question, yes, things have been done, um, but we're still here, we're still stuck. Um, so obviously, a lot more needs to be needs to be happening uh, to move things forward, and it has been for everyone involved. And of course, I'm thinking about the family. Uh, 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 um, you know, a harrowing six years, and it will be until until obviously some truth is is out. Yes. Please. Hi. Would you think of this? What's the next step in this special relationship that? For your prediction for mm. based on what your beliefs are so far. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, as as kind of social scientist with with a with a penchant for literature, philosophy, etc., I don't believe in predictions so much. So I should I should qualify my my remarks by saying that I'm not an astrologist or you know, <laughs> we don't do that. Um, why? Because things are indeed, I mean, I do believe in what I said earlier in terms of things being very much open-ended and, and in flux. It is a moment of transition uh, of kind of interregnum and, and it's difficult to see uh, how these patterns will evolve. However, um, I do stand by what I said earlier in terms of, uh, you know, finding this uh, strategy of 
emboldening, you know, the, the Sisi regime, uh, a, a very short-sighted uh, strategy, yeah? Because it's actually exacerbating the problems um, that, you know, the Egyptian society suffers from. Um, it's exacerbating the pressure on migration. Um, it's actually creating a very ambitious, you know, um, middle power, you know, in the middle of the region, which will soon have probably the strongest navy in the whole, you know, of the whole Gulf. Because, you know, once you kind of start adding these things up, you know, you end up really with, a, with quite a massive sort of military capability, which then will need to be used somehow, right? So, so these are the kind of premises for something that potentially could be quite destabilizing, which is why it's absolutely sort of, you know, uh, uh, contradictory uh, to say that, you know, it is in our interest to, you know, to promote CZ stability. I think it's very much the opposite, right? Um, and then in terms of the kind of Egypt itself, I, I have to say absolutely with, uh, with in full honesty uh, that I'm not a specialist on Egypt, um, you know, in terms of its economic or political, you know, history or contemporary sort of society. Um, what I do focus, as Francesco said, is, uh, you know, Italy in the Mediterranean and the Middle East. However, I think it's quite persuasive, you know, something that, again, colleagues such as uh, Andrea Teti, uh, Gennaro Gervasio uh, recently have been saying, uh, you know, that this regime seems to be quite, I mean, so basically there's an illusion, again, to sort of paraphrase my title, there's an illusion of stability, yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a kind of a mirage of stability, um, and it's in fact a regime that is, in, that is extremely fragile. It's authoritarian and at the same time fragile. So there's something called, I can't remember actually, and I don't want to misquote them, but they use this kind of paradox of the fierceness of the regime, the ferociousness of the regime, and yet its fragility. And this makes a lot of sense also in terms of what Hannah Arendt used to say. You know, when you use violence, when you end up using so much violence, it means you're very weak. It doesn't mean that you're strong necessarily. So how will it pan out? I don't know, but I don't think that, you know, I don't think these kind of signs are very promising or auspicious for, for everyone involved, yeah? I think there are a couple of questions. Do you, yeah. do you want to moderate? Shall I, shall I take them? Yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. So I think Chris was we waiting. We need to be a little bit short then... because that's fine. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you, Elizabeth, very much. Presentation with which I'm entirely in sympathy, and from an international relations point of view, in many ways it's a familiar story of power and morality and, and truth. But and on the power side, on one thing perhaps you didn't mention was the, the realist argument about Egypt as a barrier against Islamism, the whole yep. Libya connection, and, and so on. But leaving that on one side, <coughs> um, there are two special qualities of this tragedy occurring from the point of view of our responsibility as Europeans. One is the question of solidarity among Europeans. Mm -hmm. Should the French show solidarity? Is it reasonable to expect, is it realistic to expect mm -hmm. them to do so? Mm -hmm. And so on. And unfortunately, the, whatever the strengths of the European Union, of which I'm mm -hmm. as a Brit, still a great supporter, uh, it hasn't got that thickness of community yeah. which could make that happen. The second is the responsibility of a particular country for its citizens yep. who suffer this kind of atrocity. And of course, unfortunately, what happened to Julio is, 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 has, is happening in, in perhaps lesser form to other national citizens in Iran or in, in, in the Gulf and so on. And that even powerful states find themselves, as with the American group hostages at various times in Pakistan, unable or unwilling perhaps yeah. to do enough to make a difference. In 1860, Britain made a huge difference in Greece by Know, intervening in the Ottoman Empire to save its citizens on Pacifica. Um, but it's not possible in, in the modern world. It seems to me that the only things that we can do are either, and I'm talking from the point of view, say, of a country like Italy, is one, to deny Egypt things which Egypt wants from Italy. Sure. I'm not sure there is a huge amount which absolutely essential yeah. Egypt wants from Italy. Yeah. The second thing, more subtly, but perhaps more morally powerful, is to say we will deny ourselves the things that we want from Egypt. 
Right. Now, if the Italian, I know it's a lot to ask, mm. because I know what will happen in my country, mm. but if you, can, if you can say this is so important to us yeah. as a sense of country, yeah. to stand by our citizen and the principle of justice and truth, um, that we will actually put limits on how far we're going to be craving and, and sell arms and yeah. see oil contracts and all the rest of it. You know. And of course, there are plenty of interests in Italy who will say, no, no, why should we do that for one yeah. purpose? Yeah. But that's it, that's what it amounts to. Mm. Thank you, Chris. Um, yeah, it, I mean, a lot, uh, there's a lot in there, and, uh, and it's, it's interesting to see how, you, how you're looking at this. Um, I should disclose that Chris was my PhD supervisor many years ago, so we've had many dialogues, uh, such as this one. But um, to go back to your points, I mean, European solidarity for sure, I mean, one of the things that has been sort of pointed out is how little the Italian government actually used the leverage, you know, of European institutions. Um, and not only of European institutions, but also of academic institutions. You know, after all, Egypt is part of Erasmus exchange programs and lots of networks that are cultural as well. So in terms of these kind of interdependencies, for instance, Italy has huge investments in the cultural um, side of things in Egypt. You know, think about the Egyptian Museum in, in Turin and how much it has invested um, in, in Egypt. So there are these kind of mutual entanglements, which was my sort of point in a way in, in the lecture. And I think you are, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. Um, essentially, the whole point would be to say, look, well, if the, the moment when you have an interdependence, that's also a mutual vulnerability. We know that. Yeah, it's, it's a relation. If you pull out, you know, the other person will be affected. So you've got to use that strategically somehow, right? And it just reminded me when you, when you were talking about this that um, one, one thing that was very small but actually made a lot of impact um, socially and in the sort of consciousness, collective consciousness, uh, was when Macron gave uh, the Legion of Honor to mm -hmm. Sisi. And what happened in Italy is that those who had been awarded the Legion of Honor returned it to the French embassy. So journalists like um, Al Jas. Exactly, and other, other sort of some MPs as well, etc. Now that action, uh, which was pretty inconsequential because you know it just it, it literally just affects the person and this kind of you know symbolic sort of you know award, actually made a lot of impact. And I'd say probably rather than relying on you know corporate entities to somehow you know, use their leverage, which is obviously a, 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 lot, a lot more significant, it might be something at this level of, you know, the cultural, the symbolic, um, that either Italian civil society or um, the Italian government could use. But here, I think we come to the question of willingness. And I think um, I'm just as kind of skeptical as you in terms of whether they really would want uh, something like that to to be initiated, um, and in terms of exactly, I, I totally agree. You know, the issue, well, the issue of academic freedom concerns us all, and it's probably one of the issues at the moment uh, that unfortunately we have to kind of somehow deal with in the world, across the world. Um, also, because states won't come to rescue us. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put my uh, my trust in the Italian state to be able to get me out of a situation like, you know, uh, like what Julia experienced. And I wouldn't even trust the UK government to do the same for UK nationals. Oh, um, because, right exactly. Well, they have stated it explicitly that, you know, if you get in trouble over there, it's not our business, really. So there is a lot of this kind of essentially very chaotic, disorderly picture, I think, um, that, that really emerges. And, and yeah, and I, I, I don't, I'm not quite sure I'm not quite sure what the exact sort of leverage point is, the Archimedean point in this whole kind of equilibrium, but as, a, as an optimist of the will, I will say that there is, yeah. You have any, many questions? Uh, yeah. you, did you um, want to ask? Because is I, there still time? Yeah, yeah, that, all right, as so. long as I yeah, was yeah, still yeah, yeah, sure. agrees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll just kind of then, explore the kind of relationship to that, because on a rhetorical level, I'm like, it's really in regards to the Egyptian case, it seems that the Maghreb government has been more active mm. in kind of like 
uh, incentivizing like the process to go ahead and like mm -hmm. even Marta Cataria like yesterday mm -hmm. she stated that she's ready to go to Egypt without yeah. means getting the agent in the first mm -hmm. to meet with. So compared to like previous governments, mm -hmm. they seem way more involved in the change. But right. I was wondering do you think that reflects also on the more on the broader foreign policy mm -hmm. towards Egypt? Mm -hmm. And can we see <coughs> Thank you. Um, I think, you know what, I was going to be quite uh, cynical about this because Italian governments are very good at adding nuances to things, but actually nothing changes, right? Uh, I remember there's a, there's a very famous episode, I think, of Aldo Moro traveling to the United States and talking for hours about all the intricacies and nuances, and the, um, the American ambassador saying, so what does that come up, you know, what does it add up to, you know? And I think the last six years have been really a kind of like a, a, an incredible sort of joyride of nuances and half steps and sort of declarations and things. Of, and frankly, they didn't really amount to much. However, I would say that we are luckily not at the lowest point in this process. Yeah. Um, although I think as a, as a researcher, as an analyst, I think we actually, and by, by the lowest point, I mean quite literally the, the government that was in place at the time in 2016 when these tragic events took place. As an analyst, as, as a researcher, I think we should go back to that moment, to that government, uh, uh, to find out really um, what happened, what was done, what wasn't done. Um, because it is worth investigating and studying, you know, quite, quite simply. It was a crisis, um, you know, the Italian state mobilized itself in some ways and in some others it didn't. If you read the final report of the commission, for instance, they talk very explicitly of a disalignment between the diplomats and the intelligence. So it'd be worth finding out how come, you know, why you know, suddenly these two branches of the state did not cooperate as much as we would expect them to. So, in other words, I think literally from the Italian government, one would expect, uh, you know, a much more significant kind of change of pace, um, which I'm not sure will come. And at the same time, what I would also expect is a, is a much more, um, you know, sort of sustained scrutiny of what has been done uh, so far. Were many other questions? Yes, and then there was another question here. Okay. Uh, thank Please. you very much for this talk. Um, it, it struck me as a very sad reality, and, 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 and I think the key word here is cynicism. Mm -hmm. It somehow reminded me of a talk that Salad Gordon on a few years ago after the killing of Sana Kotoki, mm -hmm. which ironically yeah. compared to um, Scott Lennon and Sam Julia's killing was actually caught on camera, mm. so the world was seeing it. And what my question was really about that point about impunity. Mm. Like, I'm not going, absolutely not, <laughs> but it's somehow understandable why or how they went about the Kotoki case in terms of Saudi Arabia having a Munich sort of trial and then letting people in and then, you know, yeah. looking at But Egypt hasn't even done that. Right. Now, I mean, it did something even worse, like in five people, to right. be, are they part of that gang? And then to say, oh, no, they're not. And, but other than that, why, my question is exactly about the short-sighted nature of the Italian government. I totally agree with you on the fragility mm. combination with yeah. violence of the regime and this fake mode of instability. Yeah. Now, the question is, why would the Italian government Well, um, so 
Yeah, it's pretty appalling, isn't it? I mean, it's 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 sort of you know, it's a it's a it's a good question because it, it just it makes no sense. You know, what, what how would you explain a completely counter intuitive counterproductive behavior of that kind? I explain it um, in a way that recognizes that states are very complex machines, um, and just as there are many forces within the Egyptian state, and they don't always act in unison. In fact, the opposite is the case uh, often this is exactly the same I mean this is this is true also for Italy um, the state is is made up of many different actors with many different agendas with many different interests and it's interesting because of course you know the, the most kind of the most frequently used and abused category in the in the whole Giulio Regeni debate in Italy was national interest right so it was in our national interest to keep relations with Egypt. It was in our, of course, here's a question that absolutely unpacks and destroys that ideological category is whose interests are we talking about? Whose interests are national? Whose interests are deemed to be national? Whose interests are lifted to the rank of national interests? And of course, this is obviously not uh, the interest of the nation of the you know, il popolo giallo of the, of, of, of the collective consciousness that says, no, 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 this is important to us. This is really a national interest. This is important to us. You know, we want to know. This was never recognized as a national interest, right? But other interests were indeed recognized as important, as imperative, as, you know, uh, um, as a priority, let's say. So, in 2016, and this is very much going back to what I was saying before, we had a government that was very keen um, to um, have an international presence. It was very keen to establish alliances, unorthodox alliances, even with less than democratic states. Um, it was also a government that had a very sort of cavalier attitude towards relationship between um, state and economic interests, state and economic actors. And I'm talking about the Matteo Renzi, government who has recently you know, gone to Saudi Arabia saying that that's going to be the next renaissance, right? So this is the same person, right? Um, and of course, just you know, six months before Julio was kidnapped, he was praising Al-Sisi for the great leader that he was, right? So this is the government that we had at that time. And I think, um, you know, it, 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 it seems to me that quite literally, to, to arrive at the truth about this case, we really need to investigate and to, and to look very closely at what was done then to precisely chart this path of impunity on the side of Egypt and of sort of hopelessness on the side of Italy. Hello. understand the question and and it does reflect uh, you know a lot of kind of apprehensiveness let's say in Italy about um, about what Julia was doing in Egypt etc etc I would just say I would just say very <clears throat> very briefly um, that there was a, a parliamentary commission that looked into this for two years um, including coming to Cambridge to ask questions um, they held meetings that, you know, were very um, in-depth and thorough. They asked all the questions. And the conclusions that they reach is that Julia was a researcher that was doing research in Egypt and was unlawfully abducted. He was tortured for uh, nine days and then he was murdered. Um, and there is no, there's absolutely no kind of, you know, 
no shadow, no, uh, you know, there are no um, ambiguities in uh, what the university did uh, or didn't do. So I really just very simply, I invite you to read the report. I invite you to read the report. And in fact, I think it should be widely circulated and read because finally, after all these years, um, a lot of these kind of speculations have proven to be completely baseless. Um, and I think had, you know, the real problem of these speculations is that they have diverted attention from precisely these kinds of questions that are the real tangible material um, aspects of the matter that really need our attention, that really need good minds, you know, and, and, our, and our analysis, our, our capacity to, to really understand these are the kinds of issues that matter. And it's really interesting that even within the commission, uh, that as, as I said before, it worked for two years and it included parliamentaries, I mean, uh, parliamentarians, so MPs from all the parties across the board. Some of them started the works of the commission precisely voicing these kinds of speculations or conspiracy theories. But the report, the final report, was actually accepted unanimously. Everyone backed the final report, you know, that said what I just said, yeah? So it's interesting how precisely this exercise of working together to arrive at the truth without scapegoats, without shortcuts, you know, is leading us here, yeah? Well, look, I mean, I think this is a, it's a very important question, and it's a very broad one as well, you know, the relationship between public opinion and foreign policy that sort of rings a bell in terms of books that Chris uh, wrote as well uh, a few years back. Um, but more specifically, uh, you know, the importance of narratives, right? The importance of narratives. This is not new, you know. I mean, during the Cold War, you had a different narrative. And that functioned as a catalyst, as a mobilizer, of resources, right? Not just of public opinion, but of actual resources, money, right? Well, in the same way, the you know the global war on terror, as I said before, was 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 an enormous kind of opportunity to mobilize resources, to set up new agencies, to you know in I mean to to pass laws, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you know, as Nicholas Sonoff would say, words matter. Words are our world, yeah. And you know that narrative had an impact, a tremendous impact, uh, on foreign policy priorities, on financing, et cetera, et cetera. So how can, foreign policy, how can we avoid foreign policy being hijacked by these narratives? Well, it takes a lot of critical thinking. It takes a lot of um, you know, reflection. And Italy has been traditionally quite weak in that respect. Um, uh, so, so I'm, I'm not entirely optimistic on, on that kind of front, uh, but at the same time, reality catches up with us. So I think anyone who's seen pictures from Afghanistan now and put two and two together, you know, the war on terror and those images will probably form a conscious at some level, yeah, that that was not quite what they sold us, right? Can I just uh, introduce, and thank you so much for going yeah. through this lecture. It's really frightening to what you're saying. Uh, I mean, I'm still having to um, absorb the uh, figures that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Basically, 
was the same for me. Oil companies and um, and army companies are much much more powerful and than the Italian state and the French state and the Egyptian state, and, um, which doesn't kind of occasionally, but we see the extent to it um, in the case of Egypt. But I want to just say something, uh, if I may, yeah. in, in response to the question about um, Islamism and the card that the Egyptian governments, like other governments, have been using to say that they are the bulwarks against this kind of, of, of danger. And I think the, the case of Egypt in particular is a, is a, is a dangerous one, an important one to, to contemplate to see how fictitious this argument is. Egypt is, in fact, a very important source of radical Islamist ideas that have inspired many, many um, violent um, military uh, activities in the name of Islam. Um, after all, it is out of Egypt the Venetian Brotherhood came, more than you know, 1928. Al-Qaeda was so hybrid with an Egyptian leader. A lot of the ideas of uh, radical uh, Muslim groups have come out of Egypt. Um, we lost the president, but that was assassinated by an Islamist group. And we have tried really, the Egyptian government has been, and the Egyptian, a big section of Egyptian system, Egyptian society, and Egyptian political elite, have tried to combat this using security, violence, torture, rape testing, and it hasn't worked. In fact, the only thing they've managed to do is to export this violence abroad. So when an Egyptian government comes to say, we are putting a lid on this, I'd be very concerned, not as a politician, because politicians have short memory and short-term interests, but as society, we are the ones who pay the price because this problem is not solved militarily. It can be contained militarily. The Egyptian regime can be credited by saying we are putting the lid on what's happening in Libya, what's happening in the West of Egypt. But I, as someone who studied this and I lived this and come from Egypt, I can tell you that what Sisi is doing by putting the lid on Islamist ideas is not only having a big price in terms of human rights and regaining it, but in terms of actually combating Islamism in the long run. This is a problem, this is an ideological problem. And we did have an opening 11 years ago to today. The 25th of January Revolution was an amazing opportunity to actually engage with these ideas head on as intellectual ideas that need to be combated as such, not dealt with through a security prison. And what we uh, ended up with is, um, is someone like Sisi, who in fact has reserved that same attempt, and basically said, no, no to dialogue, no to dealing with the danger phenomenon of, the, of, of these dangerous ideas intellectually, the only way is repression, torture, exile, and killing. And that logic needs to be undermined. Um, and just I'd like to end with, with, with something, um, um, you know, what do we do then? I think this is what, what really pains me a lot, is that not only does this regime get a, away with this fictitious argument, not only does it get away with so much sales and arms sales and loans, but CC in, is in the race to reform the arms. The only country that refused, the only leader that refused to recruit him was Abu Sayyid. And that is a serious source of agony in the mm -hmm. foreign ministry strategy because they want to have their cake and eat it too. CC is not. Uh, uh, depicted the way Erdogan is, or LDS in South.
Yes, I, I, I absolutely totally agree. I mean, on the, I mean, there's not much to say about after what you said, Khaled, but uh, on on the issue that you were pointing out at the beginning, the, the the sort of you know how impressive these arms sales are, and how powerful these corporate interests are in Italy. Just a kind of an anecdote to give you, you know, a, a, a yet more another angle into it. Um, so essentially, just after. The, the, the murder of Giulio um, a few months after, uh, Matteo Renzi essentially fixed an interview between one of the main newspapers in Italy, Repubblica, um, and Al Sisi. And uh, the director of this newspaper, Repubblica, flew to Egypt you know, to interview Al Sisi. It was an extremely favorable interview that they gave. And, and this is the point, the d little detail that I wanted to share. They flew on an airplane that belonged to Eni, the energy company. Okay, so this is the extent of the entanglements between the state, because essentially it was a state-sponsored interview, the media, yeah, and corporate interests. <laughs> this is just one, you know, anecdote. Um, yeah, and on everything else, I, I absolutely agree, exactly. The question of image is very important, as you say. You know, the, it's not, I mean, you know, the arms sales are bad enough, but also there's the reputational side. You know, don't roll, don't roll out the red carpet, at least, you know. Why do you, you have to? No, you don't have to. But I think it's, it's, it's interesting in, in the sense that European governments have gotten caught up in that game of reputation and image making, etc. that is so important for Egypt, right? They seem to be playing along the same tune. You know, they seem to be you know, giving to Egypt exactly what, they, what they're asking, what CIS is asking in terms of image and reputation. And on that level, I think, again, um, you know, that could be a, color, a kind of cultural, symbolic level that would be so important to introduce some dissonance in, you know? to kind of break the story, to break the, you know, the, the, the patina, the narrative. Um, but again, whether they're willing to do it or not, that's, a, that's an entirely different question. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, then, if there are no further questions, I would like to thank our speaker thank once again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for attending this. Thank you. Thank you.